Thank you everybody for having us tonight. Um, I'm Tim Rupert from HSR Associates. I'm a project architect. My name is Brad Simonson. I'm an architect and landscape architect for HSR. Good evening. I'm Megan Prestonak. I am an education specialist in home construction. And then we do have two others that are joining us remotely as well. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi everybody. I'm Kate Winkler with Myron Construction, also an education specialist. We've got Andrew Daniels with Myron Construction acting as a principal in charge for the, the project here. Uh, so tonight what we want to talk about is a little bit about ourselves. I'm going to do a brief introduction of who we are and what we're doing. Uh, talk a little bit about overall timeline um, of uh, where we've been and where we're going. And then we also want to talk about our facility assessment recap. Um, everybody should have some handouts in front of you um, of the facility assessment. We'll go over kind of high level planning, um, some of our observations. And then uh, we'll dive right in into some concept master planning as well. Um, so over the last few months, we've been master planning um, and doing what if type of conversations and mm -hmm. dive right into that conversation. And then uh, Tip on the agenda is really community engagement and the upcoming survey process. Really talking about uh, the next steps um, after this and uh, to continue the conversation. Um, some pictures uh, with some of our names. So Myron. Yeah. All right. So I'm like I said, I'm Megan Prestonbach, education specialist with Myron. I am here on behalf of our team this evening. So as an education specialist, I work with school district, Kate and I, Kate's sitting there next door, Kate and I work with school districts on the front end of referendum planning or master planning, identifying needs, finding solutions, looking at community engagement. And then we also have, so Kate and I are more of the strategy communications portion of it, 
and Kate is actually starting to, to be taking over a leading position in this district. However, I'm, I graduated from Coley, Wisconsin, so I always want to come back. It's <laughs> nice to be back in my hometown <laughs> area. And then we have Andrew Daniels, who is our project executive principal in charge. He's our construction expert on this. So he'll be working when we start talking about master planning and looking at constructability, material selection. He's our go-to guy. And then we also have Nick Sanders, who's our conceptual estimator. So he's the guy who tells us how much everything costs. So um, that's our team. And that's who we, we've been working with the district now for almost a year. Mm -hmm. Oh, a little bit about my land. So I'm sorry to introduce the company first. We're headquartered at Nina, Wisconsin. We have an office. We have several regional offices in the state. Andrew is coming from our Eau Claire office. We have a Wausau office. I am from our corporate office in Nina, and Kate represents our Milwaukee office. So we have the state covered. Um, we are a general contractor construction manager, but we, we specialize in education. So we are the number one school builder in the state. We work um, with over 100 districts in the state to pass over a billion dollars in referenda. We've had 56 successful referenda and passing over a billion dollars of work on Wisconsin schools. So that's a little bit about us. Okay, um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about HSR Associates. Uh, we're located in La Crosse. Um, we're an architectural engineering firm. We do pretty much all uh, aspects of a building. Uh, we do uh, we do uh, highlight our K-12 educational planning as kind of one of our niches. Uh, we do a lot of work throughout the Midwest with many different school districts in, in the, throughout the Midwest. And uh, Tim and I will be kind of heading up the project for you guys, and uh, you'll, you'll see us uh, throughout the process. And uh, uh, Tim and I work hand in hand. We sit right next to each other, and, and uh, we make a good team, along with all of our other 38 folks back at the office. So we've got a lot of good, good expertise for you guys. So we are very much a team between my early and Andrew Carr, we work together as a teammate, um, and this is kind of the roles of our pre-planning and master planning. Um, so we're very comfortable here working with each other. Alright, the next slide, Kit. Uh, so timeline, um, I'm a schedule guy by kind of nature, and uh, so I like to kind of live by schedule and try to um, really have this be developed. So we've been working with the district for almost a year now um, in pre-planning um, to get to this point um, tonight. Um, with COVID, it's been uh, a little more challenging to meet, but we've been able to have quite a few conversations. And I'll, maybe I'll let uh, Megan dive into some of the detail on the planning itself here. But. Sure. I won't go into detail exactly what this plan looks like because it's in front of you and you yep. can um, look back at that. But overall, like Tim said, there's a lot of moving parts in the master planning process. So by creating a timeline, it keeps us all on track. Our goal is to work with the district to assess the buildings. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What are the needs of your buildings? And then start talking about solutions. How can we enhance education and also make the buildings more efficient? And how does that work together? So that's part of that master planning process is identifying the needs and solution. But a large part of the master planning process is also community engagement. So our goal is to work in parallel, understand the needs, develop solutions, understand how does that impact the community but then also get feedback from the community. So it starts at the board level. It starts by sharing information here tonight and as we continue throughout this process, but then also bringing in community members. So through this process here, you'll see we have two different types of community engagement. Number one, we have, we'll start with the master plan development. That started in September, like Tim said, because of COVID. Um, we can finally get in the buildings, start meeting with staff in the September timeframe. Um, and then we're going to continue to develop options. So you're going to understand the needs and start looking at some of the solutions tonight. How do these puzzle pieces fit into what can Loyal look like in five years? What can it look like in 10 years? How's this going to look in 20 years? We're going to start understanding that. And then how much is the community willing to support today? So you have to start by looking big picture. What can this building, what can this building be years down the road? But what can we manage today? 
So that's what we're going to start developing or understanding today. And then we need to reach out to the community, understand what are they looking for, what are they willing to support. So that's in the January March time frame. And that Kate will go into a little more detail later in this presentation. And then the key to community engagement is listening to what they have to say. So that's when we come back in April and May. We're going to take the feedback from those community engagement sessions and start refining solutions. And then we're going to reach out to the community as a whole and through the community survey. So again, Kate will talk a little bit about that, but the community survey is, will go out to every district resident. So the district has partnered with another third party consultant to help develop this survey. So all of the work that we're doing here in the next year is really working towards the community survey. And then every resident in the Loyal School District will have the opportunity to provide feedback on the solutions that, that have been created in the past year. And then once you go through the survey process, the community will provide their feedback and then that will give us a gauge as to what are they willing to support and how much are they willing to support and how does that fit into your master plan. So this will all start making sense once we start diving into the details, but overall this is what this is what we have been doing and this is what we plan to do. We picked April 2022 as a potential referendum date, just knowing we needed a date to work backwards from. As you see, there's a lot of moving parts and we need to start coordinating all of our efforts. So we used April 2022. Yep. So the overall facility assessment, um, you do have a copy of the facility assessment um, in front of you, um, but our process is uh, pretty simple. We like to gain as much insight as we can um, from a lot of different conversations, um, from site observation, um, from touring around the facility at different time periods. Um, so we do a lot of information gathering um, and a lot of discussions to put together uh, really a preliminary assessment. And right now at this point, um, you know, we, we're calling it a draft um, of a facility assessment, mostly because uh, if there is any additional feedback or anything that we want to add to it or anything that we want to dive into more, um, by all means, we can add that to this and keep it as almost a working document um, that we can continue to evolve. Um, so we brought in our, our in-house um, engineers and all of our staff to help to look at this facility from a nuts and bolts standpoint, um, to look at it from an engineering, so mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, look at all those components, but also look at it educationally, because um, we want the nuts and bolts to align with the educational priorities of the district as well, and really look at it from uh, the twofold, and then gain as much insight as we can from the staff. Um, and from the administration. Um, so we've met um, with the administration um, to get to this point quite a bit, um, which is good. And we also were able to send out a staff survey um, that will recap some of the highlights as well of uh, some of their feedback throughout this. Um, so the facility assessment is, is just a compilation of a lot of different um, a lot of different avenues of looking at the facility um, from top to bottom and giving uh, some high level planning recommendations within that. So some of the staff, uh, staff feedback highlights, um, we wanted to highlight high level what's working and then uh, maybe some areas of improvement as well. Um, so what we like to do is not only talk about, um, we want to definitely focus on things that are going really well within the district and maybe even enhance some of those things. But also then if, if there's any areas of opportunity um, that a facility can help with uh, to identify those as well. Um, so we sent out a questionnaire on the left hand side um, and we got pretty good response from that. And we pulled out some common themes from, the, from that questionnaire to help uh, the conversation move forward. Um, so some of the things that they identified as what's working is some of the size of the rooms um, they definitely appreciated the AC in the rooms. I think when we sent out the questionnaire, it was kind of hot, so that made some sense as well. Um, they liked the sinks in the rooms, especially at the younger grade levels. And uh, uh, separate high school and elementary school gyms, um, just separated on those two areas. Um, they identified access to copy rooms for the high school, um, easy to navigate around, and then some of the lighting and some of the other permits, and then network connectivity that's been added. Some of the areas that they identified as well as areas of uh, maybe needs or improvements. 
Do you want to go to the next slide, Kate? Okay, hey, Doc. <laughs> no worries. Um, so some of the yeah, some of the areas that they identified as uh, needs is uh, really the overall building organization and the main entry locations. Um, we'll dive into that in a little bit more detail as well. Um, but there is quite a few um, different entry points in the facility, especially when we look at the site and some of the site logistics of some of the pinch points on the site and some of the site planning as well. Um, the east side of the site um, to where we entered tonight um, with the drop off with the dead end street coming into the facility, just really no setback from the street in that location. Um, is the area of uh, opportunity that we'd like to dive into a little bit more. Um, climate control and consistency of heating and cooling, um, especially when we look at how uh, cooling was added to the facility um, and adding the mini splits to those cooling spaces. Um, you're bringing in a lot of hot, warm, humid air and then you're trying to cool it with those mini splits. Um, it does create some temperature control um, conversations um, that we want to identify as well. Um, electrical outlets, um, not a surprise. These facilities were built long before um, we had a lot of the technology that we're using today. Um, so that is a very common, common uh, concern from a lot of staff that we see. Um, storage is also something that's identified um, very common by staff as well. Um, we want to make sure that they have strategic access to storage where they need it and when they need it. Um, grade reorganization, um, allocate a couple of grade levels and more chronological order is something that they identified as well. And then uh, more classroom space, educational space, especially in the elementary school um, is something else that they identified. Some of the things that we've noticed, um, so we'll dive into uh, kind of some high level planning and we'll go over the detail of the facility study. Um, but we do like, highlight some of the things that we noticed as well um, through the facility analysis. Um, some fast facts about the site, you know, about 15.5 acres of overall site air area. Um, while you have a lot of green space to the west of the site, um, your east side is very pinched um, and very long linear building here, um, really a result of quite a few additions, um, six additions onto this facility, really made for a long gated facility. Um, and really did help to really spread that out. But what it does is it really almost chops your site in half where um, your east and your west side of your sites really act independently of each other with really no interaction between there. Um, a lot of your parking is on the east side where it's relatively pinched and your west side is where you have the open green space. You also have opportunities maybe on the west side um, if we are to have conversations about any expansion capabilities. Um, so overall site organization um, is, in our opinion, a little disconnected. Um, you have the main entries for on the east side for the elementary, and then you have the high school down to the south, and really little relationship between them. Um, you have to go through the city streets to get there. Um, ideally, um, especially for this size facility, um, maybe look at combining those into one centralized area for opportunities for sharing resources on not only a site, but also sharing resources maybe within the building as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about the east side circulation. Um, it really is some safety and security concerns um, with that being a pinch point on that side in particular. Um, and really just no capabilities to um, help improve that with the limitations of some of the site on that area. Uh, the west side uh, does have open space. Um, the overall site area um, for this size facility, um, it's kind of like storage within a building, you can never have too much. Um, you also want to make sure that we have enough site area. So for this size facility, um, we'd recommend uh, about twice the size site. Um, and what that really does is allows for master planning. Um, obviously, um, we have the constraints of where the property borders are. Um, so what that really means is that we want to utilize the site in a very efficient manner and we want to make sure that um, we can make it as efficient and as usable as we can and very strategic um, to utilize the site. Um, we also identify a need for 
maybe a more public entry and identify a public entry um, potentially on the west side of the facility um, over there. And then we also want to talk a little bit more about some of the athletic field improvements and some of the recommendations that come along with that. Um, as we understand that, really the athletics um, drove the initial conversation. And then we wanted to go back that out and actually talk more about master planning um, before we just isolate any athletic improvements. So really look at those in conjunction with each other. Okay, next slide. Um, so existing floor plan, um, we also got it up over here and we have it in front of you as well. Uh, we identified each of the different eras of construction. Um, so you have uh, just over 130,000 square feet of uh, space within this facility. Um, it's about 259 square feet per person um, is what that equates to. Um, that's right within what we'd recommend for overall okay. square footage usage. Um, you, you do have six additions onto this facility. Um, your most current one, um, while it might seem um, more current, it was actually in 97, and that was 23 years ago. Um, so time does fly, but uh, that's your most current addition to this facility. Um, your original facility um, is 1937, which is in the core, core part of the building. And then it's been expanded on um, really from there. Each of the additions really did meet a need at the time when they were built. And they were built uh, by far very well and put together very well. Uh, but what it did do was made for a very long linear building, mostly because of your site constraints of how that was arranged. Um, when we it just get from one end to the other, um, you're talking about 730 feet um, of a corridor. Um, so what we'd like to have conversations about is instead of having it feel very much like a long linear building, it takes a long time to get from point A to point B to maybe talk more about how a building core could help to um, really have that be more centralized and then break out from there itself. <coughs> and then some, currently you have about 514 students within the facility um, itself. And then maybe next slides. So we also identify some key space needs as well. Um, the other thing before I maybe dive into each of the individual spaces is from a overall facility perspective, especially if you read some of the report and some of the comments within there, um, the facility is very well taken care of. It's very well maintained. Um, you guys are doing a great job really keeping up with the general maintenance. Um, what we're gonna be talking about is for areas are more educationally focused. Uh, mainly because of the condition of the current facility. And some of the needs really revolve around more of an educational planning perspective and making sure that when you continue to make improvements within the facility, that there are strategic improvements that meet the long-term vision of the district. Um, so we talked about the building additions, really over 83 years um, of evolution. Um, not uncommon to K through 12 planning, but we have something to be aware of as well. Uh, other key individual spaces that we've had quite a few conversations about to get to this point is uh, your vocational education center. Um, really your tech ed spaces are um, traditional and set up and very um, original um, to when they were constructed. Um, they're also um, quite separated from each other. Um, you have a lot of individual spaces within there and what we're seeing in current trends in those type of spaces are much more open, more flexible learning, um, more of a STEM or engineering focus within those spaces um, to allow for more hands-on learning. Um, so that is an area that we, I think as a team we all identified as a need um, and just give overall more square footage in that space to be able to do the great things that are happening in that space. Um, giving more opportunities. Uh, we talked a little bit about the main entry, potentially on the west side of the facility, um, where there is expansion. What that would do is create a core, or more core of the building. It might make a little more sense when we show maybe a concept plan. Currently, the kitchen receiving area um, is on the lower level. Um, what we would probably recommend is actually um, having the kitchen receiving um, and a common space creating an actual public entry common space. So that's not just a cafeteria. It can be more multi-purpose and it can really help to um, 
be kind of the most public space of the building and uh, supporting spaces like the kitchen or receiving um, adjoining with that as well. Um, we also identified needs within the overall office area. Um, so currently your offices are um, separated from each other. Business services are separated from the high school. Um, the elementary school is separated from the high school. Um, it's a safety and security conversation, but it's also a staff resources and efficiency conversation as well. Um, just making sure that you have enough uh, coverage um, in those type of areas and really uh, having a more centralized area uh, allows for a lot of efficiencies within that. Um, cafeteria commons at the main entry, um, having that be more of a multi-purpose space. Uh, family and consumer education, um, there's a conversation about uh, upgrading that space and creating more of a culinary experience within there as well. And then the fitness center. Um, the fitness center is a relatively tight footprint for what we'd recommend and be able to have some expansion capabilities within there. So high level, a um, lot to all of those, but those are the kind of the major themes that we pulled out from a lot of our conversations. Okay. I'll maybe let uh, Brad, you want to go on the site planning? Sure, I'll just try to plan a little bit here. Um, no, fine. No. Again, as Tim talked about, um, kind of the main entry is a key component to um, to our site planning, and and also just overall general circulation, vehicular circulation, as well as uh, sp specifically cars versus buses, but then also pedestrian circulation. We want to make sure that's a good safe um, safe system that we utilize. And and as as Tim talked about, the building starts to kind of uh, generate a lot of the site planning. Um, but they do work hand in hand. Um, thinking that if we create a core within the, the, the central part of the building, that's going to be maybe our main entry, commons, kitchen, cafeteria, those kinds of spaces that separates the elementary from the high school and middle school, that becomes kind of the genesis of our, our planning. With that, um, we think <coughs> it's important to separate the cars and the buses to a certain degree. So we're thinking a car drop-off um, might be a, a good functional aspect to the site in the front of the building on the west side. And then we could certainly bring in the buses um, on, on the back side along with a receiving because those two kind of work somewhat separately in time frame. Um, so, so buses in the back, cars in the front, drop-off, trying to create a, a, a good queuing line for not only pickup but also drop-off. So we get uh, plenty of space there for, for parents to, to come and, and, and do, do the pickup or drop off. Our parking areas, um, again, we want to organize them so that they're convenient to the school building main entryway, but also convenient for large events um, for the athletic com complex as well. Um, we thought it was a nice feature to be able to try to save, save that grove of trees. That's quite a spectacular piece of, of grove of trees, I would say. So, and, the, and then the kids play there and they can play in the trees too. It's, a, it's quite a, a nice complimentary thing to have happen. Um, and then uh, with, with the, the athletic complex, we think that there's really good opportunities here to, to create a football field track complex kind of in the central, baseball, softball, utilizing what we're using currently. Just the organization of that makes a lot of good sense to us because it's not only a nice, you know, you can see the athletic fields from the front of the building, which is a nice feature. A lot of schools don't have that capabilities. But also the athletic fields create a nice foreground as you're coming down the highway to the building itself. So we think that all of these things are starting to make some sense, quite honestly, and we certainly look forward to your feedback on, on any of these ideas. Um, so yeah. uh, anything to add there, Tim? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to have the what if conversation um, really early on. And so these ideas are very much high level planning at this point, um, meant to really generate more conversation um, to continue the master plan. Um, mm -hmm. But by no means is this finalized. You'll see probably many iterations as we keep going. Um, it's really a snapshot of where we're at in the current planning. Uh, what you will see is probably more and more detail as we continue to refine this um, plan itself. 
what we're really trying to utilize is utilize more of the west side of the site um, and utilize those opportunities for any expansions area um, and take some alleviate some of the pressure especially up here and even some of the pressure down there with really a main entry off to the side um, that can really have the parking lot frame a lot of that as well over mm -hmm. What is plaza? The plaza? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what that is trying to do is connect um, the main entry, um, which is located right here, connect the drop off area to some of the athletic fields. Um, so it's a landscape place. Mm -hmm. That's all that is. More pedestrian, certainly. Yep. And, and again, the size of that is yet to be determined. Yep. But, but it could be a nice feature for the front, front entry to the building, quite honestly. Uh, what we're trying to really do is organize the overall site um, circulation and really separate those modes of transportation coming to the site um, and also help to identify um, identify the main entry and put the main parking by the main entry yeah. is one of the key, key characteristics of this. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, we want to make sure the main entry is easily identifiable for guests uh, that come we want to make sure that everybody knows this is the main door. This is where we go. So it's going to be a, a nice little feature there, I would imagine, at, the, at that uh, commons. So we're also trying to really efficiently utilize the site area that we do have and utilize that um, for a lot of multi-purpose type of spaces as well. Um, so utilize some of the play spaces, um, the football. Um, we can have conversations about is that synthetic turf so that we can utilize that for um, not only practices, but for games and utilize that space more multi-purpose. Um, knowing that the site constraints are what they are, we want to make sure that we're utilizing the site to the, full, to the fullest. <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So similar um, to the site planning conversation, um, we do have an overall building layout as well. Um, really again, meant to generate more conversation. Um, some of the key characteristics, hopefully you can uh, see some of it, or I know we're all kind of spread out here as well. Uh, some of the key characteristics of, uh, of the overall site in, in the building organization is the main entry. Um, so what we talked about, the main entry off to the west. Um, what we're entering into is uh, building addition. Uh, so we're proposing uh, addition not only for a centralized office space, but for a centralized uh, commons cafeteria um, on the west side of the facility, um, utilizing um, some of the existing spaces and helping to connect those spaces um, to each other, um, utilizing the site for the main entry, and then uh, really helping to organize the building core um, of the facility itself. Um, within the building core, um, we have support spaces, the kitchen um, receiving area. Um, in this plan, we're actually proposing to use, utilize this current space that we're in. Um, it makes a great uh, receiving area um, already raised up for some of the receiving and storage as well um, for a loading dock to relocate that to the east side of the facility so that the west side can be the more of your public entry at that point. Um, so we're utilizing as much of the existing <laughs> footprint that we believe makes sense, um, and then doing strategic improvements for any additions um, at that point um, that may be required. So really organizing from the main core of the facility. Um, what you do notice is instead of being a long linear building, we start to organize it from the building and then going out from there. Um, utilizing uh, a lot of the existing spaces and maybe just fine-tuning some of the program um, within those spaces. Uh, similar to having a centralized office space, um, we're also proposing to have a centralized uh, library media center um, for uh, the elementary as well as middle school, high school. We think there's some efficiencies uh, to have one larger space that's maybe more subdivided and can be more of a resource and a hub for the entire facility. Um, not only there's their staffing efficiencies, but it also creates more of a destination space um, within your core of your facility. What we see libraries becoming today is less, um, less about the building stacks within the building and more of a focus on breakout or collaboration spaces and really being that hub, that really destination that you want to come to within a library.
Um, so we see libraries as um, maybe uh, really enhancing that and being within the building core allows that to really happen. Um, working out from the building core, um, we're also proposing um, to have conversations about a potential gym addition. Um, we've heard many needs within the district itself to really um, have more, um, not only practice space, but just uh, overall gym space within here. Um, so we are proposing, um, as part of the master plan, an option for a two-court, um, full two-court gym space um, with locker rooms and storage as well. And then even longer vision or range planning to have an option to expand that gym even further. Um, within all these planning conversations, we want to make sure that these are long-term type of solutions and that you have options for even growth even beyond what we're showing today within here. Uh, the existing elementary school gym, uh, we think that could be strategically transformed into a band and multi-purpose auditorium space. So really a multi-purpose space um, that can be utilized by the greater community. Um, on a daily basis, uh, the band can utilize it. Um, they got nice high volume space within there. Um, helps to alleviate some of the congestion that they currently have, uh, but allows for more flexibility of that space with a good connection then to um, the current uh, vocal room space as well. The overall building organization um, does help to really work from the core and on and out. Um, we also have uh, some supporting music spaces and flex collaboration spaces that we're proposing as well. Uh, utilizing um, the existing gym, the existing girls locker room, uh, relocating the locker room from the lower level as part of the building addition and then be able to expand the current fitness center and training space um, into a building addition with potentially really good views out to the athletics as well and good connections out there. Um, one of the other key characteristics is uh, really investing in the vocational education spaces uh, and really to be able to invest in that um, to add adequate square footage to be able to do that. So the location that we're proposing is actually relocating from more centralized here into a building addition um, in utilizing um, the existing classroom spaces and the office space as some of the supporting spaces for that. So um, we think there's a good connection also to expanding the egg classroom and lab space adjacent to that and even looking at options for a joining greenhouse on there as well. Uh, the current family consumer space uh, create a more of a culinary experience within there also a good connection to the Ag program and Greenhouse, really create a good synergy between those different programs. Uh, some of the existing spaces that we've been looking at renovating is uh, the current elementary school library, uh, creating a special ed suite at that location, um, really looking at uh, having that be really suited for those needs as well. And then in the existing cafeteria, um, there's identified needs for um, not only a daycare, but also an early learning center. Um, so a lot of pre-K and K could be, um, could be utilized within that current cafeteria space. So quite a few different kind of moving parts. Some of them are as simple as a room name change to identify these. Um, obviously some other ones are a little more extensive. Um, parts of renovations and what if conversations to really help with some of the master planning of the site to improve really what we see as uh, improving the overall building organization itself. So quite a bit to kind of take in, we mm -hmm. understand that, but uh, any, any comments, questions before we kind of talk about maybe next steps here? I would just like to add, you're going to look at that and be like, what does this cost? That's yep. the next part of the master planning process. So now that we've kind of put those puzzle pieces together, looked at the site, looked at the building facility, looked at the educational improvements, now we're going to bring that back to the team. And Nick, with, that I sh shared the picture of earlier, he's going to start looking at what, what does each space per square foot, what would that cost? So then in early December, we yep. come back with numbers as to what does that cost, and then we'll work with Baird, your financial consultant, to figure out how does that fit into your tax levy and what would the impact on your taxpayers be. So we need to start with the concept and then kind of work backwards and all the other pieces do fall into place. Okay. Well, we go to the next.
next slide, Kate. All right. So we'll okay, talk. so yeah, engagement, uh, is it okay to move on to this next section? Any questions before I start? Okay. So this is a lot of information that you've received so far. Um, you know, it's a, lot, it's a lot to take in, I understand. So, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to share with you are the ways that we can connect this information with the community. And so why do we do community engagement? Um, you know, there's a number of different reasons why we want to get into community engagement. And what that actually means is as, as Megan alluded to um, earlier, community engagement means sharing information and then listening and listening to what our constituents are um, interested in and what's important to them. So when we say constituents, we mean parents, we mean staff, family members, uh, we mean community you know, members, uh, citizens in the, in the community, we mean businesses, um, all of those folks who have some kind of interest and stake in what's happening at, at the school district. So we, in looking at the timeline, so this community engagement slide, uh, the next two slides are looking ahead. So we're looking ahead to winter and spring of what comes next. So as Megan said, next up for the board, now that you've seen this high level concept is of course, what will, what will this cost? What could it cost? What are some options that we have available to us? Um, and the next step is to kind of get some feedback from the community. So the purpose of setting up a community engagement program is to share the information. So we're going to share the information. I mean, how many people in the community know that there have been seven additions in this building? You know, how many folks know that it, it was built 83 years ago, you know, before World War II? So there's some things that people um, may or may not know that we can share. And so that facility study becomes the core of the information sharing that we start with. So here's what we, here's what we heard, here's what we have, here's what the needs are. So then there's also an opportunity for people to learn. Let's learn a little bit more about what could be done in our existing space, as Tim and Brad just presented. How can we improve our educational facilities? How can we make the athletic fields more accessible? How can we improve site circulation? So kind of educating them about the master plan. And then the third piece is really understanding what is the estimated cost? What could this cost um, or different options cost? There might be you know, several different options that are, that are proposed. And what is that potential tax impact? And so that's another opportunity to educate people about um, potential tax impacts. And so Baird and your financial advisor become involved with that as well. So really what we kind of envisioned is a series of focus groups. And you can see the picture on the screen is, you know, pre-COVID. So we've got people um, meeting in person. This is a, the school district of Moston. They just passed a referendum in November. Uh, 54.8 million is quite a large referendum, but they are building a new, a brand new elementary school. Um, and they held a series of community engagement meetings to walk folks through these steps. What are the needs, what are the options, and what's the potential cost? Another great um, uh, factor about community engagement is that it helps to build trust and transparency. We would not want to uh, walk through this process with the district administration, with the board, and then you know, come to the community a few months later and say, well, we're going to referendum, you know, here's what we've decided. It's a collaborative process. We really want to bring people along, bring them into the conversation and use it as a, a learning opportunity. Lots of people have not perhaps been in the school in a long time or don't understand how the needs have, have changed for education now. So it's a great way to show that, um, what we can do for kids in oil. Um, and finally, it helps us to inform the strategy for the survey. So as we go through this process, we're thinking, how would these, how would these questions, or what questions are we hearing that we want to explore on the survey, on the community survey that school perceptions will help you with? Um, so that's another way to build that strategy. So how do we do that, and what's the process? And I, and I just want to assure you that HSR and Myron 
have a lot of experience with community engagement and we have a lot of experience working with districts of all sizes and that we will walk with you through this process and so what we do is help to lead work collaboratively collaboratively with the district and the administration and the board um, to set up the types of meetings that work best whether they're virtual in the COVID environment whether they're in person or hybrid you know whatever works best in the community um, so we develop an outreach strategy how do we invite community members to the table how do people feel comfortable coming to listen and learn will it be on zoom would it be in an in-person meeting is a little bit of both you can see on the screen i have an example of a postcard that we sent out in Watson. so um, again I, the previous slide kind of showed the series of three goals that we have for community engagement and in Watson, we have a series of three one per month the goal was to capture community feedback these meetings are progressive so we certainly don't want to turn anyone away if they can only make it to one session we want to encourage everyone to be there but we do want to let people know that you're going to learn something each time and often you'll have um, people who are maybe you could call them frequent flyers who maybe show up and say you know they might be not so positive about these types of things but those are exactly the folks that we want to be there so that we can talk with them and connect with them and find out what their questions are um, but overall for example in Boston these were quite well attended um, they have an elementary school kind of off in the a uh, little bit outside of town with pretty low enrollment and there was some concern that there might have been talk of closing that elementary school so quite a few folks showed up for that conversation and in the end it was decided that it was best to keep that school open so that really informed that particular survey question when it came down to um, funding capital improvements at that particular elementary school so there was these were actually quite well attended um, and finally we want to again raise the awareness about the community survey that's coming soon and so the community survey becomes your data point as the school board to um, make good decisions and make good informed decisions about whether or not you want to move forward with a referendum and if you do what would that look like so the last thing I'll talk about um, tonight is that community survey process so again going back to our timeline we're looking at developing the survey over the summer so first comes kind of this initial high level what's the cost of this in the meantime in the background in summer and january we're going to be formulating a schedule and a strategy for setting up your community engagement because we're going to want to get that rolling by january february um, and start to get that that process moving because it will take a few months to move through so by late spring we're starting to assimilate what we learned from from the community engagement and start to build and write the survey questions so that by summer we're really feeling comfortable with where we're at uh, with the scope with the questions that we're going to ask folks so we're ready to launch by the time we go back to school in September of 2021 that that survey will start to hit mailboxes so on the screen, I have an example of um, the front page of the Boston survey right here where my cursor is. And so it is working with school perceptions. They, they do a fantastic job. Their um, surveys are quite predictive. They're very experienced. And so that's why we are glad when districts um, partner with them. And so the, these are mailed to each household in the community. And the survey is also sent to parents and to staff by email. So why do we mail a survey to every household in the district? Because the majority of people who are voters are not directly connected to a school district, to the school district. So anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of folks don't have a child in the school. And so how do we reach them? We don't have their email address. We may not have their phone number, so we're going to send them a survey in the mail. And then people have the option to take the survey either online or they can fill it out um, the paper copy and mail it back there's an envelope that's enclosed each each survey has a unique access code so the um, chance of, of potential fraud or people taking multiple surveys is very low 
And so each person returns their survey either online or they mail it back. Typically the response rate is anywhere between 15 and 20% on the high range. And that's actually really good for this type of survey. So we want to try to get at least 400 responses back. That gives us a good statistical probability of being able to say, will these projects be supported or not? So it's kind of the benchmark. If we get more than 400, that's fantastic. But that's kind of the baseline. Again, touching on the timeline, we want to target this for September. Of course, we've got a little bit of flexibility in there because you have allowed a lot of time for planning, master planning, which is great. We do have time to adjust if we needed to. The survey development itself, writing the questions, proofing it, it's not unusual to have 20 versions of the survey before it's finalized. It takes a few weeks and then it goes to the printer and it gets mailed. Usually we keep it open over two weeks and two weekends, so about three weeks total. You will be able to see access the results then. And usually they're formally presented at a school board meeting, which is open to the public, and then publish the results on the district website as well. The other image that's on the screen here is a promotional flyer that we created for MOTS. And so typically what we'll do is also build a strategy for awareness about the survey. So a number of different ways that we can encourage participation. And that might be posters that go up in the school or in the coffee shop. It might be flyers like the one that you see on the screen. Something that can be mailed out or emailed out to parents and staff. There's just a lot of different ways where we can try to raise awareness about the survey because it's important that people feel that their voice was heard. So that we can say, you asked about, you know, we asked you this question and here's what we heard back. And we are developing a facilities master plan and a solution that reflects the priorities of our community members. So it's a key part of this process. And you will be able to quickly tell once you get the results what is supported and what is not. So with that, I believe that is the last slide. I just wanted to pause and ask if there are any questions about community engagement or the survey. I just wanted to add a point. Kate did a great job explaining the two different methods that you're using for community engagement. That task force focus group method and then the survey. Now your focus group method, those are two to three progressive sequential meetings. It is common to get people who are connected to the school district to those meetings. It's the parents, it's the staff, grandparents, people who have a vested interest, coaches, they want to make a difference. And that's great. But Kate brought up a good point. You want to get those other people there. So something to keep in back of your mind today as board members, district leaders, who are some people you'd like, who you think should learn this information, who have valuable input, who are some community influencers that you can think about? Because we'll start inviting people in like January timeframe. So start thinking about who are some people that you think should be getting this information, who can provide valuable insight, but also we'll continue to keep that message alive in the community. Because in the fall, that next survey will come out and that's very broad. So that's gonna touch everyone. And that's where Kate said that 75 to 80% of the community that's not connected to your school district, that's where you can get the true information from. But it is important to get that cross section early so you're building that survey with information from the cross section. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Like who are, who are some community movers and shakers you think are good to have at the table in the January, in the early spring time frame in those community engagement sessions. Overall, as a state, school districts have seen a lot of success at the polls recently. Um, in this past referendum cycle, there were two failed referenda in this, for facilities in the state. Um, and a lot of it is to do because of this process. Uh, we see success today, yes, because we start early, we start identifying the solutions early, but we sh we're guiding districts. Districts are going through this process by identifying what the needs are and then asking the community early. So 
I just want to bring a point to that, that there's been a lot of success and a lot of it's due to this engagement process. So that's why we spend a lot of time focusing on that. So I guess with that, we wanted to give kind of a snapshot of some of the planning that we've been um, that we've been doing and some of the upcoming steps. Um, I guess is there any comments, questions? Um, otherwise, we do plan to give kind of continual updates as we continue development as well. Just a question: Would, yeah. would the PowerPoint that you presented was, was very good? You know, broad view. Is that going to be available to us, you know, or could it be available, you know, um, provided, if, you know, if we wanted to review it again, just, okay, again, maybe talk about some of the same things here in this. Yeah, uh, so I'll dive into more detail. Um, I do encourage you to, you know, look through that. But, uh, you no, know, we can make the PowerPoint available. I think it's a great resource um, to continue the conversation. So then what's, what's your recommendation, you know, as far as the timetable, you know, you're you're talking December, I think, for the whole master plan development. Really, the community engagement starts in January, so it sounds like there's you know, kind of a lot to get started with in the next month, month and a half before. Yeah. The so we have an early concept right now that okay. we're continuing to you know push against. But what we really want to do is bring the community in before we develop it much further. Um, we really do want to get their input here up front because um, we can keep revolve, we can keep evolving this, but we want to get their input really from day one. Um, so that really is our next step is to help engage that overall community. And that's when Kate mentioned the meetings are progressive. That's why we're st they're starting. This team is starting to create these concepts, and that's why the meetings would be progressive because we want to respond to their feedback. So whether it's two or three, we still have to figure that out. But we have to better understand what information are we trying to derive so we can build that information and get them as much information to make a clear step as to what comes next. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Nice thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you guys, too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Nice our consent agenda items. Um, first of all, everyone has agenda in front of them. Anyone need a copy? Uh, Mr. Lindner, do we have any updates to our agenda? Um, yes, we should uh, approve our new coaches. Winter coaches? Yep, winter coaches. Okay, so we'll add that. Okay, so in consent agenda, we're gonna approve the agenda. We're approving minutes of the October board meeting. We're approving minutes of the October 26th special board meeting, uh, minutes of the October 21st athletic committee meeting, and minutes of the October 1st technology committee meeting. Did anyone have a chance to review those meeting minutes or have any questions about them or concerns? Okay. And in our consent agenda, we also have financial reports. Carrie, did you have any report backs? No? Did anybody have any questions or concerns? Julie, you're here. Anything you wanted to share with us? Okay. All right. If no one has any concerns about those five items, I would ask, I'm sorry, six items, I would ask for a motion to approve our consent agenda items. 
I'll make that motion. Carrie, is there a second? No second. Davey, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, consent agenda items approved. Uh, next, we're moving into old business, um, which would be student success. Uh, they met and are going to give us an update and report. Right. We met on November 11, and we ran through the um, action steps of the student success strategic plan. So in post-secondary education, um, action steps were have at least a presenter for junior and junior high. They do this annually. They haven't due to COVID, they haven't had anybody, but they're still looking into um, having somebody for that. Um, they held um, a financial aid meeting like they do every year, um, and that went very well. Um, they are still doing the uh, at least one job education fair, and um, that um, the juniors do go to Eau Claire, um, UW Eau Claire, and the tech school. And then um, it was, is it the eighth grade that goes to Spencer? Yeah. Yep, and that so. was great. Um, and then we still offer the um, UW courses, MTC um, courses as well. And then the extracurricular activity goals, um, uh, we changed it from RTI to the GIFT. Um, it's more of a challenge this year due to the block schedule. Um, so they sent a survey um, out to the staff um, and um, they're doing more enrichment. Um, uh, one with the math um, program is doing more enrichment. The Rupert Gold, Goldberg, uh, Mr. Hansen is doing more um, with the band group as well on that. So. They're getting more enrichment um, time with that, but um, it is more of a challenge this, this year. Um, send um, um, not all. Oh, the, one of the challenges with that was not all staff members are available during that time. So um, they're we are build, they're building a ACT prep for quarter three for the juniors. Um, and then they're going to switch for the 9th and 10th. Um, looking at getting kits from CESA, um, what, Mr. Deepman, that was the kits, what, I can't remember, the kits for CESA. STEM kits. Yes. Science, technology, engineering. Tech kits, yeah. Um, next year, hoping for a different outlook for the get um, time. So hopefully it'll fit into the schedule a little bit different. And then um, we are doing leg after school on Thursdays. Um, after um, Thanksgiving, it's going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and then last year, we held a yearly um, family fun night for the staff. Um, we are, due to COVID, um, we're kind of throwing around ideas. Um, we still like to do something for the staff and kind of get them um, together, but we'll throw out some ideas and um, hopefully be able to do something for them. Quality education. Um, two student success committee members to attend curriculum meetings. Um, that's annually, it's still ongoing. Um, so we're hoping to get some newer teachers, some newer ideas coming aboard. Um, offer early childhood education and CPR, we still offer that. Um, uh, the financial literacy program is still going uh, K through 12, so that is um, going good. And then we have a senior investment class, so that's good. Um, the pause program is still going on in the elementary. Um, we all want to open the door to more ideas. Um, get more things and get um, like more positive behavior, get better enforcement, stuff like that, um, get more there. Student safety can, is always ongoing, so continue to provide um, 
mental health services, want to reach out to um, the Marshall Clinic to see if they have any re resources um, to help us with that. Um, <coughs> but that's ongoing as well. Uh, playground safety, need to look at um, some of the equipment out there. Um, but Glenn is still doing a wonderful job as always. Um, and then continued, he's always continuing the organized um, playground activities out there. So um, everything is going good. I did have one item I was hoping Nancy would be here but maybe Doug and Chris you can follow up on this um, Mr. Bennett has been such an amazing addition to our playground and the safety and the issues I think are pretty much null and void now compared to when and the reasons we hired him um, I believe one of our biggest reasons was to hire him as well is to free up our teachers during that time and are we still ha are we having two teachers out there with him I do believe one I do believe there is one with He's out there, and I do believe there's another, there was a teacher that rotates okay. on a schedule with him. Can we look at that and make sure it is only one teacher? Okay. Uh, I did have some suggestions brought forth that we should go down to one teacher, so I think there may be more right. out there because um, they feel like, you know, he's got it under control. He does such a great job, and we could, those teachers could be utilizing that time for other things. So if you guys wouldn't mind following up on that, please, and you could definitely touch base with Mr. Bennett, um, see what his ideas are there, but I definitely want to bring that forth. Okay. Um, I see he even made the front of our uh, our Myron book, pushing the kids on the playground. So again, I think we just need to give a shout out to Mr. Bennett. He does pretty much anything and everything we ask of him. So, Okay, anyone else have any uh, questions for Carrie or the Student Success Committee? Okay. We'll move into new business. Um, we are going to discuss and approve our school property and liability insurance for 2021. So you should have, the, was it an executive? It was a, well, it was under, are you logged in yeah, as I yourself? Yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah, I, are you logged in as yourself or are you logged in just through the general website? The they wouldn't have access to the executive. Could you send it yourself, it. or did you send it as? Well, ask anyone else. I'm in as myself. I, I have never. I haven't been able I to see it either. Yeah. Me either. Okay. All right. I put it on this afternoon on, in the executive section underneath that um, that item on the agenda. Yeah. But later in the afternoon, when we finally got done discussing it, when I put it on there. Okay. Can we just give a quick overview, yep. maybe? Yep. <laughs> um, couple things um, the insurance center uh, versus spectrum uh, I, I thought uh, they, we saw the insurance center come here and give us a presentation last time um, spectrum that was Brian Hess uh, spectrum Jesse fur came to uh, the district office and sat down with even I and went went through that um, I think coverages for both are very very similar. Um, I don't know for each coverage if it's apples to apples, um, but I think they are similar enough. The one question I had um, that Brian has brought up from uh, the insurance center was the, the cyber liability coverage and um, I, I really liked what they had for it compared to what um, Spectrum did or what Spectrum had um, in talking with with Jesse, um, that he, he would do more of a standalone cyber, something separate, not using the, the spectrum policy, but using a, a standalone policy for our cyber um, policy, which would basically make it a little more stronger, better coverage, um, and not for that bad of a price, I think. Uh, Overall, the difference was like 500, 600 bucks, um, but the coverage was from about 100,000 with the spectrum. The standalone would be more like 500,000. So, and the insurance center was like a million on, on everything. So that's what I really liked about them. Um, the, the insurance center was a little bit cheaper. Uh, then um, I, 
think three thousand dollars when it came right down to it and then spectrum um, so that price you know that is something to, to look at um, we've been with uh, spectrum for many years um, and have had no issues as far as I know with them so um, Even do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, like you said, uh, when when the insurance center came in and did their proposal, I don't remember, but their cyber coverage was outstanding. It was like a million dollars for each issue. And when Jesse came in, his proposal had less coverage. So we went back to him and basically he pretty much matched everything they had, but it was like, um, well, it was like $600 more, five, 600 yeah. more yeah. to get that, that higher coverage, but it was on a separate policy, which I appreciate. I thought, you know, then actually it was, the policies themselves were, were fairly comparable. We've had Jesse for, well, I've been here since 1995, and I've been working with him for the majority of that time. He worked for, for Wausau Insurance, he worked for Liberty Mutual. We've had him as our school insurance agent on and off, mostly on for that entire time. He's also helped us with health insurance too. He's, he's an excellent agent. He's very reliable, very nice. This other company was very nice too. I didn't have a problem with either one. Um, but I said, I, you know, I, it's hard to say. <laughs> it's very hard to make the decision because it seemed like they, they were both fairly, fairly comparable coverage and the prices were pretty close. Like I said, I, I've got a lot of faith in Jesse. He's been our agent for many years. So, Have you found with Spectrum that our, our premiums kind of stay the same? Is there a lot of waxing and waning as far as those go? Well, it's been pretty much the same. Last year, it wasn't as good. Our, our, our premium was a little higher because we, they had, um, because of our, our workers' comp rate, okay. the, the dividend wasn't as high. And I think last year the dividend was like 13% on the $28,000 workers' comp policy. And now um, our modification factor went down, so they're, they changed that to 25% this year. So that part helped you know, bring their premium down. Okay. But some of that you can't help. You know, it's based on claims made, so. Carrie, you're an insurance expert. Any <laughs> thoughts or opinions? That they sound <coughs> comparable to me. Yeah, they were they were both very comparable. Like I said, I, local schools have used the insurance company too. I think Owen Withy, mm -hmm. you know, he had some local schools. Mm -hmm. Auburndale. Pitch. Auburndale. Yeah. I mean, so it sounds like more coverage as far as the price goes with the insurance company. Company. Well, no. Because um, don't you say we're, we're at a million for most of those? Well, for the for the cyber, cyber. just cyber. Okay. For that cyber. Yep. The rest was all pretty comparable. Okay. There was there wasn't too much difference on. Actually, um, Jesse's policy had a little more for the educator's liability, had more coverage there, okay. and less on the cyber. And then he came in for five hundred dollars more. He would match the cyber, to what, you know, the insurance center had. Okay. So. Actually, you know, the educator liability part for the Wausau, uh, for, for Jesse Furr had more coverage on that one. Okay. So, and his, but his premium is a little higher, so. Okay. Which, you know, <laughs> who knows how much you're gonna need, I guess. I've never really, you know, something I've never really utilized a whole lot, you know, that we've ever actually even tapped into that, so. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Harlan, any thoughts? Anyone got any ideas? Was, was there a reason that we went for different price quotes? Did it just happen? Is that normal or what? Um, we hadn't gone for price quote for a few years. And I, I think it's probably been three years since we actually had put it out for bids. And, you know, I guess I thought since we had a new board, we had new, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go out and just put it out there to make sure. You know, it, it's an expensive thing. I mean, we're talking, you know, a fifty to sixty thousand dollar product. It doesn't hurt every once in a while to, to throw it out there for prices to make sure everyone, you know, is all on the same page and, and okay. 
you know. So that's why we did. There was no problem with the previous company. We just oh no, okay, no, okay. no. I like I said, I we hadn't had a price. We had, I hadn't thrown out the for prices probably for three or four years since we've actually had a price quote from another company where they've come in and you know showed us what the different prices are. You know, every once in a while you do got to kind of mm -hmm. you know we have responsibility to the taxpayers to make sure we're we're you know investigating this thoroughly and making sure we're getting a good product and a good price. So. We appreciate you staying on top of that and doing that. Yeah. <laughs> did you say Spectrum upped theirs to the million on the cyber? Hmm? Did you say Spectrum did up it to a million mm -hmm. on the cyber? Mm -hmm. okay. I just know okay. cyber attacks are on the, well, the that's rise yes. in the and last Actually, I, what like I had to have a lot of stuff, it had some information on that. <laughs> so I'm sorry you guys weren't able yeah. to access yeah. that. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, like I said, of all the things that we talked about, that was what had got I was most interested in because yeah. we've been hearing so much about people getting hacked and yeah. it isn't just you know mm -hmm. us losing our information it's you know maybe they've accessed everyone in our system and gone in and so they got to do credit monitoring they got to do you know reestablish people's identities depending on you know it, it's a big thing mm -hmm. and with COVID everyone's <coughs> at home you know more mischief on the computers, I guess. Because <laughs> they say cybercrime is out, so. Yeah. Well, does anybody feel comfortable putting a motion out there? We could. Uh, I'll just say, I'll just say, it, it, it's tough, it's very comparable, uh, but I I would lean towards, for my recommendation, would be Spectrum. Stay with, stay where we are? Yeah. I'd move that we, we uh, approve Spectrum as our insurance carrier. Okay, there is a. And Kim second set? With the, with the added coverage on the cyber security. Yeah. Okay, so we have a motion to stay with Spectrum in a second. Is there any further discussion, questions, or concerns? Okay, all those in favor of staying with Spectrum for our school property and liability insurance, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, stay with Spectrum. Um, next, we are going to hire a full-time custodian. Yes, I recommend that we hire Darren Bogdanovich as a full-time custodian for us. He will be on the night crew cleaning the elementary. What are the night hours? Uh, 3.30 to midnight. Yeah, midnight, okay. I think they punch out. And so is it just him? In the elementary. Okay. And then we have that Gary Morrison's, Gary Morrison's, on, Morrison's on the high, high school, school. Okay. All right, if we could have a motion to approve Darren Bogdanovich as our new full-time custodian. I'll make that motion. Harlan? Second. Carrie? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, welcome Mr. Bogdanovich and thank you. Um, as long as we're hiring, approving, we will approve our youth winter coaches as an addition to the agenda. Yes, um, so for girls basketball, we have um, Stephen Allison Schley and Jamie Wolf and Kristen Almond. I do believe two of those get paid out of that. So okay. um, we'll, we'll check it out for sure. Okay. On boys side, um, we have myself and Greg Brock as of right now um, and Possibly Brandon DeSmet's dad for fifth grade. So, okay. wonderful. Okay, if we could go ahead and have a motion to approve the youth winter coaches. I'll make that motion. Carrie. I'll second. Harlan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you for volunteering and donating your time. Uh, next, we will discuss and approve the bus contract addendum. Okay, with this, we are still in negotiations with the Greenwood Bus Company. Um, thought we'd have this settled by now, but we don't, so we're close. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask you to table it one more time, please. Okay. All right, we will table this till next month's meeting, till December meeting. Uh, then we are also going to discuss and approve uh, the second reading of the Title IX policy, which you have attached in board docs. Um, 
Mrs. Coleman's Burgers, our Title IX coordinator. Have we had any new changes, updates? Nope. Okay. The policy is as is. Um, I would recommend that we do a second and a, this be the final reading okay. and accept it as our policy. Okay. So if I could have an motion to um, approve the second reading of the Title IX policy and this and the, let's see, how would we want to say, uh, the second, second and final policy. reading yeah. of the Title IX policy. Carrie. I'll second. <laughs> Tom and Harlan. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, next, we are going to discuss. Um, we have our upcoming spring election. We have Carrie Becker from the City of Loyal, who will be up for re-election, and Harlan Hinkleman, our area north of Highway 98, up for re-election. Um, so Eva, it looks like, uh, well, there's a board election on the 6th. Your new position would begin on April 26th. Do they need to get any paperwork or anything to you? She's got it. You guys make sure you sign those before you leave. Um, <laughs> If you are not going to run again, we have forms called no notification of non candidacy. It has to be filled out by December 28th. Um, if you know if you have no intention of running again, try to fill this out as soon as possible. So that gives more people time to to come forward and you know maybe there might be someone out there who might be interested in being on the board. That oh well this person's already on it and he's doing a great job, so I'm not going to run against them or her. Yeah. So if that's your intention. Please fill it out as soon as you can, so we get the word out there and get people on it. December twenty eighth, five o'clock. If you are planning on running again, and we got the declaration of candidacy, this has to be turned in by five p.m. on January fifth. So there's not a whole lot of time between you saying you're not or you saying you are. So as soon as you you know have a decision made, fill out the paperwork as soon as possible. Okay. Can and I, I have the copies here? Harlan and Carrie, I think you both do a wonderful job. You're great assets to the board, so mm -hmm. I, I personally hope you continue. Um, next, uh, we had an addition. We are going to have just discuss um, some COVID guideline and communication issues that have come up, <coughs> some ideas around, um, see if we need any formal meetings. Um, there is no action, no voting on any of this discussion, okay? Um, <sighs> I'll kind of kick it off with just uh, the communication part. Um, just recently, you know, we've like, like Mr. Diekman said, he's had a lot of time on the phone with parents and staff members and things like that. And I just want to reiterate, especially to our public, is to, you know, I don't know if chain of command is, is, is the perfect word here, but, you know, realize that, that we do have levels in the school. And I think it's really important to give everybody an opportunity to tell their side of the story or to work with you. So I would always, always suggest, and as a board too, when you're dealing with community and parents, make sure, you know, if, if a parent comes to you and it's a teacher issue, make sure they've talked to the teacher. Parents, please reach out to your teachers. Um, then go to your respected principal, Mrs. Pop on the elementary and Mr. Diekman on the junior, senior high school end. I mean, we hired them as our advocates um, no one knows more about our students, our staff, than those two. That, that's their job. We have to give them the opportunity and the respect to deal with that issue first and let them, them speak. So I really, really encourage us as board members, I encourage staff, I encourage you know parents, please try to go through those channels first. I think you'd be really surprised at how amazing these people are to work with. And of course, when everything fails and you cannot agree, you cannot, you know, meet somewhere, Mr. Lidner is always there to listen to your concerns. And then it is also his job then to talk with those respected people. You know, it's, it's not all on his shoulders. Of course, if Mr. Lidner can't settle an issue or something going on, the board would be an appropriate place to reach out to. Um, of course, we are a board and that's how we function so well as a group. You know, none of us are individual agents, nothing that one of us can do but listen. Direct in that chain of command, bring forth information. Um, so, you know, that there's a lot of heightened issues, a lot of concerns. So I'm really just asking as a community and as a school 
we just really follow, try to follow those respective guidelines. So like I said, the people who are involved at that front line get that first opportunity to fix the problem rather than it going around them. I'm not saying there's been a big issue, but it's just a nice reminder, okay? Um, communication, as far as communication goes, um, Eva, I have, we have a big favor to ask you. <laughs> um, sometimes at these meetings we set other meetings and then maybe they don't need to happen, like tonight we had one at six. So some people showed up at six. <laughs> Can you kind of keep an eye on that for us? If we set a meeting and then the next month, oh, it changed because we're going to do that, would you be able to help keep us informed? Okay, um, yeah. We had kind of talked about that meeting, I guess. Yeah, and as a board, too, if you hear one's canceled, maybe send out something group <laughs> just so we can okay. help communicate with each other. Um, does anybody else have anything about com just communication suggestions, questions? Mr. Diekman, Mr. Lidner? Certain, I was going to say certainly, Jen, with uh, communication uh, and, and your presence here at school on a regular basis and some of the observations, that I think that was good, sharing those observations with our staff and with us as board members too. So, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, if you're going to continue to do that, I think that's great and, and uh, you know, just some feedback. Mm -hmm. I, I'm definitely going to, yeah. I hope that, I hope the staff felt that way and. I, I got a lot of, I got a little over 20 responses um, and, and very good responses, things I didn't know. And when I talked to these teachers, when I observed certain things, when I just peeked in their doorways and, uh, I learned a lot and I just, I had to share it with them. And um, I do want to have school board days where we come into the school, whether you watch a class, help in the lunchroom, watch them take temperatures. It's a little hard right now because of COVID and we don't want to, you know, we, we are all here, but these are really things I'm going to try to organize and whoever can come, you know, them seeing us here and just what they do, it's a big deal. So. Yeah, I would highly encourage anything you can do. Just jump in. The lunchroom is fun. I'm going to say that. It's fun and they are an amazing group down there. Wow. <laughs> um, if we don't have anything else on communication, um, I'm just going to jump back a little bit. Uh, clearly, you know, we've got a lot going on with COVID. Um, Governor Evers um, put out, you know, a new address asking people to stay home. You know, we're not, no one's quarantined or there's not a stay at home order yet. Uh, masks are looking at going out to January now. Um, we had gotten an email as a group from a parent. Um, I had um, about an hour long conversation with that parent and follow up. And it did prompt me to get some more information that I did hand out to each board member. And it also prompted me to work with um, Mr. Deacon and Mr. Lidner on sending out a staff survey. I kind of feel like you can't do one without the other. If we don't know how our staff, our families, and our children are feeling in the school, you can't make these kind of choices. Um, but I know as a school board we're limited, and I know there's a lot of conflicting information out there, so I finally just went to some sources, like right to them, like, tell me once and for all, I want it in writing, what can and can't we do? The email from the parent was very good. We had a great conversation, you know, a lot of suggestions out there. Um, but in the end, once everything was resolved, this parent really wanted to know, as a school, as a school board and administration, why can we not give power back to parents? Why can we not say, okay, let's say the second grade, one child has COVID, they go home. Can a parent sign a waiver that says, my kid has no symptoms, but let them come in and we'll monitor him instead of now how we say, okay, the whole second grade class, you go home, okay? And before school started, that is the plan we had talked about, <laughs> is, is the kids positive, tested, go home. We didn't know we were limited. I don't think anybody knew we were limited until it started happening. So the first page you guys will see here is a letter from Brittany Muse, our Clark County Health Department health officer. Um, she states three statutes, um, but then she basically summarizes it by saying, Schools must follow the isolation and quarantine guidelines set forth by local health officer and health departments and do not have the authority to change or modify the isolation or quarantine guidelines or time frames. Um, we did touch on this with her at our meeting in the, the large gym when they did a 
a virtual meeting with us, but this does give you some policies here, and we can certainly post this, put this out there, send this home with our kids, our staff, so people can look into this to understand it a little more. Um, please understand that sometimes when you do call the health department, you don't always get a health officer. They are so bombarded, sometimes they just have helpers, and you might get some conflict in information. So I, I do ask that you understand that piece. Uh, the second piece on the next page is I spent some time on the phone with Kirk Strang yesterday. He was out of state, so I, it was kind of delayed, but he is our legal counselor for Loyal. He's wonderful. Um, and these were just some tips he gave to us to really think about when we think about going rogue, I guess, would be, be the, you know, to develop our own guidelines. He first says, follow and give due consideration to local state guidelines. Follow the advice of the health department. They are your experts. If you choose not to, you are on the fast track to negligence. We breach the duty of due care by not following the guidelines. Follow your safety standards. If you show disregard for standards and recommendations set forth, you are setting yourself up for a loss, especially when it comes to a lawsuit. Um, We've had people ask, we've asked, and this is information I learned about waivers. Do you know that a waiver is not technically uh, enforceable unless each person has had the opportunity to negotiate their waiver? So generally, speaker waiver, generally speaking, waivers are not enforceable. A waiver or excusing liability is only enforceable if each person signing is able to negotiate their very own terms. Handing out a piece of paper does not meet those requirements and you cannot fall back on a waiver. I just thought as a school in general, that was really good information. I think a lot of times we feel like, well, if we just send a note home and they sign it, we're good. Not the case. <laughs> so this applies to a lot of other things besides COVID. Um, I did also talk to uh, Barry Forbes. He is our WASB lawyer, Wisconsin Area School Board. His, his words were exact. Don't be the lone wolf. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. Um, especially in the time we're in right now with the heightened numbers, the stay-at-home orders, our local hospital, you know, is in not, you know, they're, they're struggling. Now's not the time to look at cutting back. Um, now is the time where we work with our staff, we make sure everybody feels safe. We keep protecting ourselves, our students, and our staff. We tend to forget all the, you know, the students that are out and don't want to wear masks, but we have to remember our staff that feels safe being here because we enforce this. So I just felt like this was really important information to share with everyone. Um, the staff survey, we have pages and pages here of comments of data that supports what we're doing. Um, you know, nobody's, you're never going to see 100% here, but, you know, when you say, you know, we have 70% of our staff saying they feel safe here with our guidelines, personally, I'm not going to mess with that. 70% <laughs> to me is a solid number. So I, I would love to have um, discussions about this, how everyone's feeling, where we're at. I know our, our community and our teachers who are watching and our parents would really love to hear where we're at. So please share. Davey, where are you at with all the COVID stuff? <laughs> <laughs> you got a new mask. <laughs> well, these are laws. You ain't got much to. Yeah. You ain't much to talk about. Really. Yeah. And and any of all the people I talk to, if we have any questions about any of these things, I mean, he he gave me permission to write this down word for word. He said I can come back with any questions. I can hand out a cell phone number, whatever people would like. So they are more than willing to help us work with us. You know. Mr. Deakman, does this any of this information help you with the struggles you've been having? Yeah, it's just that messaging. I think that's important. Consistent messaging from you know everybody at, at all the levels, like you kind of reiterated a little bit there. Um, that's that's the key. Uh, you know, we're we're in it for the long haul, I guess. And and uh, I think the more we we communicate together, the more we uh, come on common ground, uh, the better it is. Uh, the kids want to be here. 
um, is my opinion. Uh, the staff want to be here. So um, while we're here, we, we got to do what we need to do. You know, we, we sent out this survey and we did ask about next Monday and Tuesday. And then we talked about the weeks after Thanksgiving and Christmas. There is some schools who are kind of shutting down from Thanksgiving to after Christmas. Um, we have no plans to do that. We have nothing set. With the numbers continuing to rise, of course these are conversations we have to have, we have to prepare, but we have to know how our staff felt about doing that, and it doesn't sound like they're interested. Um, so I'm sure these are things our administration is gonna take, um, and we're gonna keep our doors open as long as we can. Um, I know our support staff as well, um, they are not salary, so if we go virtual, what does that mean for them? Um, you know, that's a, that's a big hit for them. So um, we definitely need to start having, I think, some planning meetings, the what ifs. Um, I don't know if that's <laughs> by having that plan, but um, I definitely think we should have a policy meeting to discuss face masks, um, consequences. We need our administration to have something they can each rely on. And if we're gonna make a policy about something, I personally feel like it has to be enforced. I'm not, I'm not willing to spend my time on something half our teachers or administration is not going to enforce. So if we're gonna do it, we're all in it. Um, I would really like to have a, a discussion about if we go virtual, what that does mean for our support staff. Um, I don't know, would we wanna do that under a recruit and retain meeting or a, just, a, do we wanna have a special board meeting to discuss just a COVID Umbrella. Does anybody have any thoughts where we could actually do some voting and decision making? Well, Kim, we have to have recruit retain anyway in December. We do. Okay. So that's what's on. Okay. The well, I was going to say if we had to recruit and retain because I thought that was coming up. Yeah. That <clears throat> obviously anyone can come from the board, so mm -hmm. I don't know that we need to have it totally separate. It's just if people know that's what's on the agenda. Sure. For recruit and retain, people can come. Sure, because we so we could do a recruit and retain mm -hmm. and a policy meeting next month. Mm -hmm. Kind of touch on all those things. Are we missing anything, guys? Is there anything else <coughs> we need to look at? Uh, I just want to say um, thank you, Jen, for taking the time to ask about this because this has been an issue that's really on everyone's minds. Mm -hmm. When when you look at the data from our school that. We've had two hundred plus cases of quarantine, and quarantine seems to be the issue that everyone has. It's not that anyone's scared of the COVID per se, the virus. The scary part is, oh my goodness, are we going to get quarantined again? And you know, when you look at our data from the school, we have two hundred plus cases of kids that have been quarantined, and really, they're not sick on quarantine. So it's, I think, it's good that people are asking the question. Mm -hmm because that tells me a good story that we're not spreading it at school, that all the mitigation that the school's doing, I mean, kudos, because even when we get a positive case here, we're not sending 20 kids home and half of them get it, we're sending 20 kids home and none of them get it. So I understand the frustration as a parent who's had someone who's quarantined, it is frustrating to watch your healthy kid sit at home and for what, but not understanding so, I mean, I think that this is still something that we should track and keep asking the question because even though the statute says um, the local health officer can take measures, et cetera, they may do what's reasonable and necessary for the prevention and suppression of disease. Well, where is that line of reasonable and necessary because where does it come in and it's affecting, you know, learning, mental health, et cetera? Because actually as you know, not speaking necessarily as a board member, but as a parent, I get really nervous when everyone has all this anxiety about quarantine, uh, and I know that kids don't want to speak up now. And we're relying on people to stay home and they don't feel good, but if we're creating an environment where people will say, well, I'm not going to speak up because I don't want to wipe out half my class or my team or my teacher, you know, where do we cross the line? And I think it's okay for us to ask that. And I would guess that they're probably going to ask the same questions by other districts too, because this seems to be a common theme of 
people getting quarant healthy people getting quarantined. And then, you know, we look at it and we say, well, our school get, will get closed down if we meet this 20%. Well, you know, we wouldn't meet that 20% if we weren't sending healthy people home. So I think it's just continuing to ask the question and maybe present it to that, to Brittany and company a little bit in that way. You know, they're trying to do the best job they can too. Uh, and so are we in terms of education, mental health, total student well-being. So where can we meet on this? But I appreciate you taking the time. Mm -hmm. And Ian, I, I, I agree. I, um, I do really think we're, we're getting to that fine line of, I, I'm, I think I'm okay, so I'm not going to say anything. Um, and that gets really scary if people aren't going to be upfront about this. I think that would really change how great our school has been at keeping kids healthy and staff healthy and safe. Um, so we got to be really careful about not crossing those lines. So I think, you know, letting people know, you know, while this may not be what we, we would choose for ourselves, um, you know, we have to give that due respect and, you know, that all that, uh, the due care, we have to just show it respect and we have to follow the guidelines or we just open ourselves up to, to so much more. But, but I do agree, um, as things evolve and change, will we always be kept up to date on the most in current information? So I think it is important to revisit these situations. Um, when I talked to both Barry, um, the lawyer for WASB, and um, Kirk, our school lawyer, they did talk, both talk about other districts as well um, and how you basically take what you can control, like policy about our masks that affects student safety, we can control that. We can't control quarantine, but what else can we control? What else is within our power as a school district? And how can we maybe take some of that light off quarantine and look at things we can control? So those are definitely conversations to keep having. Just a question, maybe discussion point, um, you know, regarding mental health, what, you know, additional resources, additional things are we doing to help students and possibly staff too? Um, certainly, you know, I think the, you know, the, that Friday work day where virtual students can come in and, and you know, meet with their teacher, one-on-one -on -one and uh, or other students who, who need some attention. I, I would think that would be a positive thing. Um, but is there, you know, do we, you know, is there more resources out there that we need to look at trying to bring in other people to help or, you know, just, just some thoughts, I guess. What, what, what? Yes, I would say there are. Um, in talking with Mr. Diekman and uh, Mrs. Comesberger, you know, dealing with health and even Mr. Cuddy, looking at different things, reaching out to not only Clark County but Marshfield Clinic for different mental health resources that we can we can provide to our staff and our students. So, um, I think the one day or the those Fridays that we've we've added and looking at more, I think are good. I don't think it's enough. I think we need to do we need to really look into more things that we can do for them. So, yeah, I think you know, one of the challenges is is is, is bringing in. That's mm -hmm. the challenge, mm -hmm. um, because <clears throat> those those professionals are also dealing with pro an over num or an over exceeding number of things. Right. Just the nature of what we're living in, too, right. and we can't necessarily get those people into the building or have those types of opportunities because of restrictions. So that is a challenge. So. Ways to do that creatively, virtually, um, without um, without the school getting into a situation where we're making those recommendations, because we got to be careful as well too, because we want to make sure that uh, we're not recommending certain things, because um, we we have to leave it open for everybody. So I think one thing that I would agree, one of the things that's been a huge asset has been um, for the for the staff has been uh, that time, you know, giving them that time. It's probably a good thing for the students too. They get a little three-day weekend. They get a little extra break from it. I've noticed um, communicating with parents that um, even the ones that are bringing their kids in or letting us have their kids in on those days, it's the communication that has helped. So I think, I think because of this, I think more 
uh, more of us are communicating with parents, uh, at least in my experience, more communicating from my part, um, even from my role previously to now, um, constant communication, you know, daily communication with different sets of parents. Um, I think teachers are communicating more. So I think that just leads to a, a better self, a better sense of less anxiety on everyone's part too, because we've opened those doors up. Um, so I think that's very helpful. And, and people have skill sets and things that we do, and sometimes just talking and, and, and getting to know that is helpful. And I you know, wondered, uh, you know, just because I, I uh, follow her on a regular basis is Tasha Shu mm -hmm. from Elzer. She does, I believe she has a mental health curriculum or, or a program. I don't know what that involves, but you know, if there's a way to utilize her Yes. You know, there's certainly be a cost to it, but but it might be, you know, because of the fact that she had, you know, presented last spring, I think it was last yep. spring. So we, we looked into it. Okay, I was um, happy. Yeah. And just as we were looking into it and trying to figure out where we can, we, where we could put it, then we went, then we got closed. And um, just in all that, we haven't gone back to looking at it. So that is definitely something that we, whether it's hers or just any mental health, and, and it might you know Perfect. some of what she she's putting out is is virtual. So I mean, it's yep. not that we would have probably have to utilize her in the building. But, no, you know, you wouldn't. You know, I I looked at it. She gave me a, a, a kind of a a viewing of it, mm -hmm. and it is. It's it's good stuff. We just, just some, you know, some uh, where can we plug it in? Now that's going to be the thing that we need to look at. So. Do we offer any mental health services to our teachers? Do we have someone, if they would like to confidentially call, talk to? Uh, do we have any resource like that for our staff? Is yeah. that something we can Look, do? Yeah. I think um, some of our teachers, you know, they're exhausted. Like Mr. Diekman said, just talking about masks alone now. The kids that have to be quarantined and be home that don't want to be home, you know, now when we're dealing with social services issues with COVID, um, our teachers are, I mean, their hearts are hurting and some of them are really struggling and I know that they rely on their coworkers and their friends and their family, but I think if we had a mental health professional that they could call off of work and we just provided that to them somehow, at <laughs> least got them the contact information, I think that would be very important. Yeah. Anything else on this topic? Harlan. I guess I have a different kind of outlook on this quarantine thing. I think, you know, I understand the hardships and the health problems that's causing on the kids. But I really think we've been fortunate this year. You know, we've had, say, one positive case. And you sent 20 kids home. None of the kids were all stayed healthy. If we'd have kept them in school, for all we know, there's going to be four or five of them, 20 that could have been turned up positive a couple, three, four days later, and they could have spread much more. So I really do think there is a need for the quarantine and keeping it that way. Yes, I know it's hard on kids, but I personally think we've been very lucky to only have one positive case out of all these groups that we've sent home. Mm -hmm. I really think it's working. I agree. I mean, it's, it's hard, you know, when they don't get it, but then you think, but had we kept them here, what would have been the outcome? And we don't know, but I don't know that I'm ready to... Are you ready to gamble? To experiment with that. <laughs> if what we're doing is working, there is data, but yeah, I agree with you. And I think that's a big part of our, our administration. I mean, we know how hard you guys work. I mean, the health department, can you imagine the hundreds of calls they place a day? You know, so it's on these guys and Mrs. Pop to just be making those calls to make sure people are informed. That's, that's a lot of time on you guys. Thank you. We good? All right, we can uh, move past this. Uh, uh, superintendent report, please, Mr. Littner. I'm going to defer to Mr. Deakman to go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so over kind of the last month here, uh, I, we talked about it earlier, just those days. So uh, the 23rd of October, November 6th were two days that we had students off-site um, staff here. 
Uh, we really had a nice turnout with some students coming in. Uh, some of our virtual families took advantage of that, of, of bringing the kids in, connecting with teachers, and, and along with that, then we're targeting some of the students uh, that need to redo some tests. You know, maybe it's uh, get connected with their teacher. Maybe they got some missing work, late work. So um, taking advantage of that, communicating with parents, uh, a lot of phone calls, um, but w which I don't mind at all because it gives me a chance to connect with those parents. So it's very well received. Um, so on behalf of the staff um, and myself and the students, I appreciate that from the board giving us those days. And I, and I really hope that's something that we look at as long as we're going to be in this environment we look forward to continuing to do those things as we keep going out throughout the year. Um, fall sports, for the most part, ended, uh, with the exception of football. Football plays their final game for the season tomorrow night down at Elma, uh, so good luck to them. Uh, we had our Veterans Day program here last week, which was a great experience. Uh, we had a lot of great comments. Um, we didn't have that many people from the community here, but it was enough. We were able to keep everyone distance. Um, our students did a phenomenal job. Uh, it, is, it is very nice to see students step up and get into those roles and take advantage of an opportunity that we have to share with the community, but get our students involved with, uh, with kind of going in. So uh, big thanks to all the students and, uh, and Connie Meyer for, you know, it really kind of setting the, the stage there with getting organized, but it was very well done. Um, we initiated what's called a smooth wall monitoring system. So that is a system that we have for all computer devices, uh, whether they're on our network or off of our network, it monitors keystrokes. So which means anything you type, it will monitor. Um, and if it's things that are inappropriate, it will send alerts to the designated people. So unfortunately, we've, we've had some so had some alerts and had to deal with some issues with the with some students in regards to that. Again, those are all handled in a way with the students, communicated to the parents, so the parents are all updated on what's going on. Um, unfortunately, it might cost some time away from a computer for students, uh, so we hold on to those devices for a while, restrict their accounts, and, and eventually, I think now we got a plan uh, to get the devices back to them, but uh, have those accounts pretty well restricted. So. Our filtering system is something else that we have that takes care of them not being able to get to certain sites. Um, and then now we're also looking at a teacher monitoring system. So if I'm in a classroom with 15 kids, um, I can pull up my computer and I can see the 15 screens from the students that are sitting in my class. So as they're doing work time, you know, I can quickly just kind of see that everyone's on task. So, because the, the big issue in the classroom is kids getting on chat sites, kids getting, um, you know, doing things that they shouldn't be doing outside of their homework. So um, we're, that's in the works there coming. Um, we're gonna trial run some of that. First quarter grade ended. I, I gotta tell you, I was, um, I was actually pleased with um, how the grades came out. Uh, it's unfortunate that you always have students that just don't do well, right? But the number of students that we were kind of tracking as, the, as I watch weekly through the quarter, um, kept going down and down and down and down and down. We had very few kids uh, that, uh, that failed courses at the end of the term. So um, that's hard work on the teachers, that's hard work on the students um, for them to, uh, to keep going with that. So, um, and then we have a plan in place to get some of those kids back in those classes so they can not miss that credit uh, this, this quarter here now. Looking ahead, oh. <clears throat> excuse me, over the next month, continue to do those student at risk days. Um, we have one coming up this Friday, already got some kids lined up to come in and give some staff an opportunity to work. Parent teacher conferences last night, we did those by phone on the high school junior high end. So um, met, kind of scheduled everything and then teachers called parents and did conferences via the phone. So uh, pretty good participation. I think looking at the ones that I kind of tracked that had it. Um, I don't know for sure how last year went, but I know as you get older, you get less parents coming in. Um, I think we might be maybe doing a little better with the con with phone conversations, probably getting some more that we normally wouldn't um, do that. We targeted the students that were at risk and concerned about whether it was academics or behavior. 
Um, we have conferences again on Monday night, uh, so we're doing the same same situation. Uh, junior high basketball for boys kicked off, and then also girls basketball kicked off on Monday, um, and then boys basketball, high school boys basketball kick off uh, next week, which brings us to opening hunting season, Thanksgiving break. So just messaging to the kids more about safety. Um, you know, with opening hunting season, it's a popular thing uh, all across the state. And then knowing that we're, anytime you take a break, there's a little bit of retraining that needs to take place when we come back. So we're kind of prepping for that retrain after we come back from uh, Thanksgiving break. I am working through uh, uh, some sample schedules for next year already. Uh, we're looking at scheduling students late January, early February for next year. Um, so I promised the staff I'd have some things for them to look out. Uh, the feedback from the staff has been overwhelming uh, that they like what they're doing now. They like those extended period of time. They like, the, they like having less classes per day, more time with kids. Uh, more instructional time and it really does increase our instructional time throughout the day so uh, but they got a few ideas thrown at me and I promised them like I said I'd get them something to look at so I'm, I'm real close I think uh, I think I'll be able to uh, talk a little bit more about it on Friday when we meet uh, with them so something for the board I'll, I'll get in your hands here over the next month or two to, to look at some ideas as well for next year um, and then just, um, I guess the big thing is, is we just continue to engage the families. Um, if we have concerns academically, have concerns behavior, uh, and then also um, continue to engage those virtual families that we have out there. Got a few back um, after first quarter, few shifted, um, so it kind of balances out, but I think the more that we stay engaged, the more we communicate, um, the more we enhance our practices for that uh, aspect of our learning, I think uh, things are going really well. Um, and then lastly, I, I would just like to say, you know, those adjustments I, I have on here, you know, keeping staff revived, keeping it fresh and keeping them excited, um, it, it makes a big difference. So um, they, they, again, they really do appreciate that and uh, look, they look forward to those opportunities in that time. Uh, and I know we structure a little bit of it and I know they still are working with kids, right? Because we're still bringing kids in during those days, but they, it's, it's, it's at their pace. Um, it's at the kids, the students' pace too, because um, that's what it's meant for, bring them in so, for some one at on one time. So um, as a, it is a challenge, but it's, um, I think we're heading in the right direction to get some success out of that. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Since Nancy's not here, can I, there was a concern I wanted to bring forward. Um, that I would have done for Nancy, but I'll do this in replace of elementary. Um, we have we heard anything about our our normal Christmas concert? Maybe Mr. Anderson can help with us. No, okay. So um, the concern is that if we had our well, we had our Veterans Day program. Um, if we are going to consider having winter sports, and each of those athletes get to have four people in a gym, why can't we have our concert? Each student gets two tickets. Um, you do it in waves, you know, maybe 4K through one, and then I, I don't know how that works for schedules, but before it's just canceled, I think we need to really look at things outside of sports that we would traditionally do and not just say no to them if we are going to still promoting, be promoting sports. I just said I would put that out there. Has anybody else heard anything about that or have any thoughts on that? I had heard today that they were canceling all, like, chorus concerts for the whole year is what I heard and I thought I didn't hear anything yet so we were going through first semester and then seeing how things and reevaluating it from I, there I would just be really careful if we're allowing sports to happen and each participant gets to bring four people into the gym but yet we're saying concerts you know maybe it's your last elementary concert or your first one or but, but isn't senior but, year but for cons but you're talking vocal or, or instrumental? Any. Because, because... The, the, the way yeah. this got brought up was around the elementary, okay. traditional Christmas concert okay. that, you because, know, runs all afternoon. Right. There, there's been a big push out there for... But, it, but isn't there research, you know, really that the idea of having the mass on and singing with mass on, is that 
something we want to encourage or not. I mean, well, I, I think I if just, we're going to let basketball players run up and down the court with them on, I think on. we need to entertain the idea of kindergartners, third graders, sixth graders singing mm -hmm. with you two know, people from their family. <laughs> but I mean, how, how do you space, do you, do you space the kids out so many feet? You know, I mean, there's a lot of logistics about that too. If, there is, but I, I just say I want to. I want to see. A, I would rather so, see a I mean, discussion just, about it rather than just to know right, if sports are still continuing. There, we have to look at everything else that's important in our school too. A lot of churches aren't having singing just because of that. So, yeah. You know, or even services for that matter. Sure. Nasty. Yes. The time. Yeah, I know. I don't. I don't see them. Yeah. I don't see. A, I see one sixth grade. Twice now until December. I know that's an issue too, but I want to just make sure that before mm -hmm. uh, families, kids, teachers are just told no, that we have those types of things. This We don't have time, we can't do it, we don't have, you know, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure it's mm -hmm. not just a hard no. Okay? It means I a lot to me. Really as far as the Christmas program, but I have heard stories in regards to, you know, sports can go, but like other things can't. So I think we, we do have to kind of watch that line a little bit. Yeah. Agree. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Lipner, are you ready? No. Nope. Yes. Um, talked a little bit about uh, last board meeting. I'm going to recommend to the board uh, compensation for curriculum, extra duty, and, and leg pay uh, that we go off of an hourly rate based off of the the base pay of our of our contract, um, which would put it up where we're looking at that I initially talked about twenty five bucks or twenty five dollars, um, and what I would do is start that in the next budget year, which would be July first, twenty twenty one, due to the fact that we don't have that money budgeted right now for for those purposes. Um, and I would also say in the month of June, if you were planning on as a teacher doing some uh, curriculum pay, get your, uh, get your um, curriculum hours approved by their building principal and then we would pay that pay for it. As long as it's approved, we'll, we will go with that. So, um, so that's what I was gonna, I will recommend to the board. We, are, we don't have action on it this time, but we will next. Okay. Um, parents hate your conferences over the phones, like Mr. Diekman said. Uh, I've heard a lot of positives on both ends. Thought it went very well, very organized. Um, so, I'm glad for that. Um, FEMA grant application. Uh, last night just got the city council to approve our don't. approve our application to go through us to allow us to do this so um, working with uh, Jordan bus on that we will continue to do that um, working on a number of different things with that so getting that ready to go in January uh, let's see here we'll talk a little bit about COVID um, right as of today, uh, district wide, so just you're talking about right around 600 people. Uh, we've had 15 positive cases overall in our in our building. So um, presently, we have two positives that are out, and we have 22 junior senior high students that are quarantined at this time. Um, Monday, we, we had a, a large amount of students out, around that 80. Tuesday, it's down to 55. Today, it was down to 45. Tomorrow, we will get uh, some more elementary kids back, so it'll decrease, I hope, more. And, and these aren't all just quarantine. Some of these, more than you think, um, are, are students that their parents are positive, and they are, they are staying home. And I would like to... Uh, so the majority of our parents, thank you, because they've helped us out immensely on if they're positive, 
or they went and got tested, they are keeping their kids home until they know for sure. Um, or if their kids aren't feeling good, they're keeping the, the siblings home with them. I think that has helped us a lot in keeping our doors open and keeping our numbers relatively down. I know I said Monday we had a lot, but it's been, it's been for the most part, good. Okay. A um, couple recommendations. I was in a, a Clark County Health meeting this or today, um, and they kind of went back on when and what what determines you to close your school the building or to go virtual or remote. Um, big part is if you are at 20% of your student population that are absent for five days, they recommend you to go two weeks virtual. Or if you will hit 50% or more student absence one day, they are encouraging you to go remote. Or, which I think is gonna be more the issue in our schools than anything is, if your staff, if you can't field your staff, um, then you would go remote for two weeks. So those are kind of the, the guidelines that we've gone in talking with Clark County Health. Um, they put that out initially when we started the school year. They really, they said they haven't had time to look at it, but that's what everyone's going off of. So, or has been going off of. So, um, I think uh, I think we are here face to face. I know we have some kids out, um, but I think we uh, I think we go face to face as long as we possibly can. Um, and we get some breaks here or there for our teachers and our students. And um, I think we work hard on the things that we discussed tonight on maintaining that. Um, I think it's inevitable that somewhere along the line we will be shut down for at least, or remote I should say, or virtual for two weeks. Um, but I, I think we need to stay on course like we have. We do have some area schools that are, are looking at taking some weeks off and, and things like that. Um, I, as long as we can, I think we need to stay that, especially after, after having how many months off and what happened in the spring. So I, I think we need to do a, a service to our, our students and our families. So um, and I would just like to thank everyone for you know, hear a lot of you know people that are, are going that extra effort and are really tired and exhausted and I understand that and I really thank everyone for helping us keep keep the doors open so um, hopefully we have a, a nice little break here for five days and a couple weeks later three weeks later then we have a another break where we can they can get some relaxation in so that's all I got thank you thank you all right, we um, have a couple meeting dates to set then. So our regular board meeting would fall on Wednesday, December 16th at 7 p.m. Um, you guys normally do recruit, recruit, uh, recruit and retain right after school, right? Yep. Who is on that committee? It is Kara, Kim, and Carrie. Do you guys have uh, any proposed dates? Wednesdays work less for me, but is there after school? Typically. Yeah. Not sure if I can do that. Otherwise it'll have to be after six. What does your schedule look like, Kim? Oh, I'm good. I can make anything 
Okay, what's the earliest you could be at one after school? Um, well, I think my schedule is just pick a day and I can see if I can leave early. Do you guys want to try like like a 4 p.m. meeting? Then maybe it would give Kara some more time and your staff would just stick around a little bit. I think that sounds reasonable. Yeah. yeah, what which Wednesday? Oh. I can check my schedule now. <laughs> Like, um, after either the second or the night, because we want to do it before yeah. the mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It's a night with like. Okay. Um, I could do the night. Then do we want to do a policy meeting right after that? Because since that's me, Kara, and Kara, you guys will already be here, I could join you at 5 for policy. Do you think an hour is enough for recruit and retainer? Do you want an hour and a half? Hour. I don't know. Hour? I've never been on that one, so. Okay. So recruit and retain at 4 p.m. on the 9th. Policy at 5 p.m. Does that work for everybody? I'll be absent, but that, that's okay. Something else that night, but if, you know, if that works for everyone else, that's, that's fine. With me. I don't think you're on either one of those, no, Tom. I'm but not, yeah, so. definitely anybody can attend. And then we'll plan on seven o'clock for the board meeting on the sixteenth. Okay, depending on what's in closed session, we'll determine mm -hmm. what time we start. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a reminder, um, Harlan and I will be here tomorrow night in the library at 7 p.m. for a Wisconsin Area School Board Leadership Conference. <coughs> it's all paid for. It's an hour and a half. They're really, really good. Um, so if anybody wants to join, anyone can from the board. I have Tammy Motion coming and she'll get you set up. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Did you get a link? Or anything? Not yet, no. That's why we didn't. No, um, didn't I will double check that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And Chris, too, in case another board member. Yeah. Harlan, did you did happen that to get a link did. for on that in your email? Yeah, did I you? Think I did. You did? I think so. Because we'll need that link. Oh, you know what? I think my all goes to like that junk stuff. Yep, yeah, I've got it right there. Okay, she'll need that link when you come in. Okay, I've yeah, got that. Yeah, right she there. said she would come and get you all set up on this. TV right here. Okay. We'll have it on the big screen, Harlan. <laughs> Bring popcorn. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, and it's okay. about an, uh, it's about an hour and a half, but they're they're, they're usually really good. So, okay. Um, is there any other public comments, Mr. Lidner, that came in? No. Okay. If I could have a motion to adjourn. I like that. Davy, second. Second. No, Harlan, all those in favor? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> mm.